Greetings once again to the Pilgrim Church family, as well as to any visitors who may be tuned in today for this uh, presentation of our daily online spiritual encouragement or dose. Danny here once again on behalf of the elders at the Pilgrim Church of Christ with our weekly uh, viewing. This is specifically for Tuesday, June the 22nd, 2021. We recently began a seven-part study series for your viewing over the next few weeks entitled The Seven Statements of Jesus from the Cross. Over the past two weeks, we reviewed the first two statements, and today we'll be, resume, we'll be resuming with a study of Jesus' third such utterance. Now, all of these statements are drawn from the four individual Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I'll remind you we'll be approaching them in the order in which they occurred during the crucifixion events, not necessarily in the order we encounter them whenever we read through the Synoptic Gospels. With that being the case, if you have not yet viewed any of the previous videos in this series, then I encourage you to press pause and to do so before continuing with this particular one. I'll remind you, you can find them in a couple of places. First, on the Pilgrim Church of Christ page within Facebook, and secondly, on the Pilgrim Church media page within YouTube. Within each week's lesson, I'll continue to follow this pattern. I will read the scripture passage that contains the statement, I will examine the setting of the statement, not the physical location. We know that that would be the cross for all seven statements. Rather, we'll focus on the time setting. That is, where does this statement fit within the full timeline of the hours that Jesus spent on the cross? Third, we'll review the factor that prompted Jesus to make the statement. Such motivations can, of course, vary, and we'll find each statement to revolve around one of these possible factors a response to the situation around him. You might recall that's the prompting of the first statement two weeks ago. Also, the statements or questions directed Jesus' way. That was the prompting for the second statement we looked at last week. Also, there's concern for those impacted by his situation. There's his personal physical condition at the time, or there is his relationship with the Father and with the Father's will. And fourth and final objective is that we'll pursue what a study of this statement indicates should be our understanding of and our response to Jesus and his sacrifice in light of the words we're reviewing. So let us continue our series by looking at the third of Jesus's seven statements from the cross. Now, actually, we find two independent statements, but in the context of how they are being spoken, they realistically embody one singular, inclusive statement of intent on the part of Jesus. The two parts of this statement are, Woman, behold your son, and behold your mother. We begin by reading the scripture passage that contains this third statement from Jesus. Today we'll turn from Luke's gospel, where we looked at for the last two weeks, to the gospel according to John. I'll read from John 19, verses 26 and 27, from the New King James Version, which reads this way. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour that disciple took her to his own home. Okay, now let's examine the setting of the statement time-wise. In order to do this as accurately as possible, I have reviewed and harmonized the four separate gospel accounts into what I feel pretty comfortable as a resultant timeline that contains all the events occurring as part of Jesus' crucifixion, both before, during, and after. Once again, I'm just going to list the highlights for today's study. If you want a more detailed description, then refer back to the first video in this series dated June the 8th, 2021. So for the night before, here's a review of the actions. Jesus celebrated the Passover feast with his 12 closest followers. During the feast, Jesus washed the feet of the 12 apostles, and he also associated the bread and the wine portions of their meal with the impending sacrifices of his very own body and blood. Jesus predicted his betrayal and his threefold denial. Jesus encouraged his companions with the heartfelt, comforting words, Let not your hearts be troubled. Jesus retreated to the Garden of Gethsemane with his three closest followers to pray fervently three times while they slept. And then Jesus was arrested and carried before Jewish leaders. 
where he was falsely tried and convicted of blasphemy. He was mocked. He was verbally and physically assaulted, and he was blasphemed just before dawn. Now when we move to the actual day of the crucifixion, we find Jesus bound like a criminal, being led by the Jewish leaders early in the morning before Pilate, where they were hoping to get Rome's endorsement of their sham death sentence. Jesus was questioned by Pilate, then questioned by Herod, then questioned by Pilate again. Pilate made two unsuccessful attempts to release Jesus, but finally had to agree to release a murderer named Barabbas instead, after he had scourged Jesus and publicly washed his hands of his fate. Jesus carried his cross for the first part of his journey to the crucifixion site, and then a citizen of Serene named Simon was compelled to carry the cross for the remaining portion of that trek. Jesus was crucified at 9 a.m. along with the thief on each side, and he was offered wine mixed with myrrh or gall. After he had tasted it, though, he refused to drink any more of it. And then there were four soldiers attending the event who divided Jesus' garments among themselves, while several observers blasphemed, mocked, and sneered at him. Now, John's Gospel record presents today's third statement immediately following his account of the garments of Jesus being divided by casting lots. We know then that this statement came at some time after this event. In fact, it could even have very easily occurred directly afterward. We also know because three of the Gospels specifically claim that a three-hour period of complete darkness blanketed the entire area starting at 12 noon. And I'm assuming that this statement occurred before that event. Note in particular that Jesus twice used the word behold when speaking to his mother and to John, and this implies that the dense period of darkness had not yet converged upon the scene. So it appears we can safely place Jesus' third statement during the time between the start of the crucifixion at 9 a.m. and the period of darkness starting at 12 noon. So next we should review the factor that prompted Jesus to make his two-part statement. Along with the previous two weeks' first and second statement by Jesus, today's is the third and final of that triad that collectively reflect his concern for the physical and spiritual welfare of others, even in the midst of his own personal physical and spiritual suffering. If we look back at the list of factors that I presented earlier as motivation factors, the one which appears to have caused this particular statement is this one, a concern for those impacted by his situation. Note these uh, observations. John's crucifixion account identifies four individuals who were present and viewing the events by name. Persons whose presence were indicated, whose presence there indicated the love that they felt in their hearts for the dying Savior. One, we have his mother Mary. Two, we have his mother's sister, the wife of Clopas. Three, we have Mary Magdalene. And four, we have the apostle John, the writer of this gospel. John also reveals that Jesus singled out a couple from that group of four to whom he chose to direct his hard-fought and therefore brief words, and this was only after he directly observed them standing there at the base of the cross. Now, before reiterating Jesus' third statement, I'd like us to try to imagine the pain that was being experienced at this moment beyond that being experienced by Jesus, by others in his life, Notice, when the infant Christ child was presented by Joseph and Mary at the temple for his parents to offer the firstborn sacrifice prescribed by law, Luke records in chapter 3, verses 25 through 35, their encounter with a just and devout man named Simeon. Led by the Spirit, on that occasion, Simeon lovingly took the Christ child into his arm for a tender caress. He blessed God. He blessed the child. He blessed Mary, and he prophesied to Mary that as a result of her child's destiny, quote, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, unquote. Luke later remarks that, quote, his mother kept all these things in her heart, unquote. So for 33 years, Mary was emotionally and mentally burdened with pondering and contemplating, with dreading this prophecy of soul piercing a prophecy which she was now, sadly, witnessing and experiencing firsthand. 
As we noted earlier, John was part of this band of Jesus' loved ones at the cross. Actually, he does not name himself specifically, but he indicates his presence with the designation, quote, the disciple whom he loved, unquote, which is how we find to his practice to be throughout his gospel in identifying himself. This is underscored by the fact that he was the only one of the 11 remaining apostles to be chronicled for posterity as being present at the cross. This also leads us to believe that the grief he felt at his beloved master's suffering would be as near as possible to equal to that felt by the Lord's mother. Now, with these backstory facts in mind, let's read the loving words Jesus gasped to the two people closest to him literally and physic and uh, emotionally. John 19:26 says, "He said to his mother, "Woman, behold your son." Parenthetical statement here. On first glance, some might interpret this as Jesus calling his mother's attention to his own situation. But there seems to be no reason for that to have even been necessary, and besides, Jesus' follow-up statement to John appears to invalidate that interpretation as well. For in John 19, verse 27, he said to the disciple whom he loved, Behold your mother. Another parenthetical statement here. This manifestation of Jesus' concern and instructions regarding the future care of his mother also implies that she had at this point outlived his earthly father, Joseph. The disciple whom Jesus loved, the apostle John, indicated his reciprocal love for the Savior by honoring this dying request of him. We find in the first chapter of Acts, when the upper room scene is set in anticipation of the promised baptismal visit by the Holy Spirit, along with the surviving apostles, which of course included John, we find, quote, Mary, the mother of Jesus, unquote, listed as being there as well. No doubt, having accompanied the one in whose charge her crucified son had placed her personal care. Now finally, what message should we pursue as being real, revealed to us by this third statement from Jesus? While researching this lesson, I ran across the following. It's a, an April 1982 online posting by an author named John Piper. Here is, are his notes. We can all take courage in the care and power and provision of our Lord. One, if he was eager to care for his mother, how much more eager will he be today to care for those who hear and do the word of God? Two, if Jesus could provide for the needs of his own in the moment of his greatest weakness and humiliation, how much more can he provide for your need in his present wealth of power and exaltation? Third, if Jesus purchased the church with his own blood and ordained that in it bereft mothers should find sons and sons should find mothers, then no one should be without a caring family today in the body of Christ. So that completes our study for today of the third installment from our scheduled weekly review of the seven statements of Jesus from the cross. I hope you have found this study to be interesting, to be encouraging, and to be a motivation to delve even deeper into a study of God's word. I also pray that you'll be able to continue tuning in and viewing these videos, either when they're posted uh, on Tuesday mornings or at any time, simply by viewing the archived versions at the previously provided link sites. Until next week, I urge you to study God's daily prayer, study God's word daily, as well as to go to him daily in prayer, to give thanks for your blessings, to lay before him your request, and to remember and ask his providence upon those who are in various states of need. Today, I urge you to be in prayer particularly for the family of Robbie Guy. Robbie passed suddenly last week, and his funeral service is scheduled to be taken place later this very day. Shirley, Laura, and all of Robbie's extended family would certainly appreciate you remembering them in your time with God. Please rest assured that you continue to be in my prayers daily. In previous videos, I've mentioned a book which, although it's secular in nature, it's still fully scripture-based. Its subject matter is Jesus' crucifixion, and it's a book which I have found to be very interesting. It's written by Jim Bishop, and it's called The Day Christ Died. 
I'm convinced that you will find this heavily researched and extremely detailed presentation quite helpful in trying to comprehend the events Jesus personally experienced through his selfless sacrifice on our behalf. Now, as I close today's study, I'll conclude with this encouraging passage benediction from God's Word. Again, I'll be reading from the New King James Version. I have chosen 2 John chapter 1, verse 13. It reads this way, Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Everyone take care. I hope you have a blessed week and look forward to presenting our next study. Until then, remember I love all of you. God bless you.